The train now departing from Platform 1 is a time machine from a different world. She set out from Brighton Works in 1875, such a long time ago that she was already a bit out of date when the very first aeroplane flew. And yet, somehow, she survived in this throwaway world to reach us after 125 years. And miraculously, she's as good as new. It seems the nation that invented the steam locomotive doesn't really like to throw it away. A whole century of trains survive, including many that were already hard at work a hundred years ago. But they're not all tucked away on heritage lines like this hard-working trio on the Bluebell. Old and new still meet on the mainline network. The train that used to cross the channel meets the train that now goes under the channel. Arguably, Britain's greatest museum is on wheels. But to appreciate the nation's treasure house of trains, it does help to have a guide. And who better than the man who's owned the giant freight engine Black Prince for more than 30 years? the artist David Shepherd. He is, he says, a man who loves giants, elephants and tigers, as well as steam locomotives. And his paintings of giants have featured in hundreds of thousands of prints. I, I just love this baby of mine. The nightmare problems she causes me with the money worries ever since I bought her. But it's worth every penny when you're on the footplate actually enjoying it like this, even on a short run. That's what it's all about. I mean, there wouldn't be any point in owning 140 tons of engine unless you actually drive it sometimes. No point in having it. Back in the 60s, David Shepherd helped to save several steam locomotives from the scrapyard. But it was only financially possible because of the elephants. His wildlife paintings gave him the cash to rescue steam engines from the scrapyard. Without the elephants, there would be no Black Prince today. He was also able to capture on canvas the dying days of steam in a way no camera could ever hope to. But where did his love of engines begin? Daddy had a beautiful O-gauge model railway. We lived in Tottridge in North London. And um, <laughs> I often wonder what the present owners of the house think because <laughs> he took over the best bedroom for his model railway, O-gauge, so it was big. And to get a better curve between Euston by the doorway and the crew by the window, he bored a hole through the chimney breast <laughs> to make a tunnel. So people living in the house now must wonder why the chimney smokes. <laughs> This chimney started smoking exactly a hundred years ago, a product of the Long Hedge Locomotive Works for the South Eastern and Chatham Railway. It's the classic 060 tender engine layout. By the beginning of the 20th century, most of the principles of good design were already established. So, did the steam engine change much in the next 60 years? Not a great deal, really. Um, the bulk of change was to do with new design in the sense of bigger and faster locomotives, more powerful locomotives. But the basic engineering was really the same from the 1800s onwards. I was given a, a very rare book a little while ago, which dated from 1850, and I was amazed at the quality of engineering and the, the design that uh, was evident from reading this book. And that's 1850. So they must have progressed very, very quickly, and certainly by the turn of the century. Um, as you can see when you look around you, there are locomotives which we consider to be comparatively up to date. It's only really after them when things like superheating of locomotives and, and the sheer size of what they were producing, I think, made any real fundamental change. Change is so difficult to predict. 
This Lancashire mill looks like the rock of ages and was certainly built to last. But for all the imposing grandeur of the architecture, it couldn't survive economic change any more than the nearby Civic Hall. the humble motive power of Victorian industry steams on. This Lancashire and Yorkshire engine would have served the mills and perhaps given the mill workers their first seaside outing when, in later years, up to a million people from the Manchester area alone would have headed for resorts like Blackpool. It's been beautifully restored and works on holidays and high days at the East Lancs Railway where the sight of a self-propelled furnace still draws the crowds. Modern engine men tinker to keep it going, and children who've only seen Thomas the Tank Engine are torn between fear and wonder when they meet the real thing for the first time. A fragment of film from the turn of the century shows how little some railways have changed. It's the Metropolitan Line to Amersham, already electrified and serving commuters just like it does today. Engine number one survives after working on the Met for nearly 70 years and will eventually be returned to steam. The most striking change is in the people, all stiffly formal a hundred years ago, but they'd probably think of us as a scruffy lot, not a handlebar moustache in sight. At least one Victorian engine from the Midlands retired to the seaside, and today it's on Santa special duty. Right. Here we jolly go then. This is the Swanage Railway, where they've succeeded in what Dr Beeching found impossible, making their branch line a viable part of the local transport infrastructure, and that includes bringing families into town for their Christmas shopping. Right, we're just leaving the station on a slight downgrade. Heading to Castle. For operational reasons, this train is top and tail. In other words, there's another engine at the back, pushing. Right. The engine we got today is a little 1F locomotive from the LMS. Used to be at Stately Ironworks. And it's doing very nicely on the Santa Specials today. Now we're just going up the upgrade into Corfe Castle from Norden. In truth, we're not really doing an awful lot of work because it's 257 Squadron is pushing us, but uh, we have to do something. including David Shepherd, believe steam engines are rather like horses, living things that will respond to kindly treatment. A diesel, you see, I'm going to be controversial now, I stick my neck out, but I think I'm not a diesel fanatic because I believe a diesel to some degree is inanimate. It's like a car, you get in, switch on the ignition or whatever you do and it goes, but it won't respond like a steam engine. If a steam engine's half ill, it's sick, any fireman will tell you you'll get it home by talking to it or kicking it, you know, loving it or hating it, and it'll respond, it'll get you back to the shed, and then it'll die on you. But it won't die in the middle of a main line like a diesel might. If there is such a thing as a classic locomotive from a hundred years ago, it would probably be the Terrier, the engine that always struggled to look as though it was in charge of the train, being completely dwarfed by its carriages. Oh, 
love this little bit of engineering. Um, the materials are, are slightly substandard in the sense they're made out of raw time instead of modern steels. But bear in mind those terriers were, were made when there was no motor cars. Um, horse and cart was the main mode of transport apart from the railways. And so they were the, the concord of their day really. Um, but they're beautiful things, made like a watch. And these days of course we, we try and make them as authentic as we possibly can on rebuilding them. And it's a pleasure to have two of the little engines here. The trains were getting heavier, so operating departments wanted more power, a familiar story throughout the 20th century. There was a new generation of engines from Brighton Works, but, as ever, the last person on the designer's mind was the bloke who'd have to wriggle between the frames every day to oil the motion of this latest machine designed for getting the masses to work. They were really the modern commuter train, uh, or I say modern, you know, the, the turn of the century commuter train engine. Um, I'm not sure there was as many commuters in those days, but it was a very intensive service. And our South Eastern Railway H-Class tank, and of course Birch Grove, um, used to run that type of traffic into London Bridge and Cannes Street and so on. But what was this turn of the century steam engine like to drive? This engine is peculiar insofar that it's got a vacuum brake for the train, an air brake for the engine, and if all else fails, we've got a handbrake to park it on. This big lever is not a brake, it's the reverser, and that is forward, and if we bring it back to that position, the engine goes backwards. It therefore follows that if it's in a position roughly in the middle, then strictly speaking it shouldn't go anywhere, because the valves are set so that it doesn't. Um, the engine hasn't got a gearbox, so it follows that, if you like, bottom gear forwards is when the lever's there. And once it's underway, you can, what's called, notch up, which brings this lever back up. So instead of steam going in for the whole of the travel of the piston, it's now going in for a, a smaller percentage of that travel. So but to start the train off, we need the steam to go in for as much travel as we can. So we've now got a vacuum brake. The engine's in forward gear, we we'll take the handbrake off, and then we're ready to go once the other train arrives. By the way, for guard, look over. Okay, Steam coming out the front is from drain cocks, which just allow the surface water to come out. Once the thing's underway and it's dry at the chimney, we can shut them up. Grove is living evidence that even a hundred years ago Stevenson's rocket was a museum piece. I mean rocket was built right at the sort of first quarter of the last century wasn't it? I, haven't, I don't know when, you know it's more than I do. But it didn't last that long and by the time this century came about we were really running around behind engines that hadn't, didn't change that much. You know, they, they lasted until the end of steam, in fact many of the classes did. They lasted 50 or 60 years before they went out in the days of BR, at the end of steam. They were still running. During the second decade of the century there was something sinister stirring in the undergrowth. Something born from the most terrible of circumstances. It was arguably the ugliest engine of all time, and certainly among the most difficult to drive.
This is how the railways went to war, with the driver sitting sideways in an armoured contraption that ran on petrol. Only a train could carry the immense amounts of men and materials consumed by trench warfare, a train running on lightly laid, narrow gauge rails. Of course, they tried the steam engine, but often with disastrous results. Well, if, if you have a steam locomotive in a, in a war situation, it is a very obvious piece of machinery. It makes smoke, at night you have a fire, it makes steam, which can be seen quite a way away, and therefore the enemy can have pop shots at it, and um, one shot in the right place on the steam locomotive, that's the end of the steam locomotive, you, you just have a pile of rubbish on the side of the track. They were seen at night, obviously their fires were very, very bright, and um, great disadvantage there, again you could be got at. There was very limited protection for the crew, they could be shot at, and certainly if the locomotive blew up, they're not going to survive. So the internal combustion engine entered the fray. They could get up close to the front with quite a reasonable load. They could go over lightly laid track, and therefore they could approach the front with the ammunition. Heaven help the drivers who got hit, but they could, they could approach right up to the front without being seen or without being heard, deposit their load, and then get out fairly quickly. And that was another disadvantage of steam. It couldn't get out anywhere very quickly. This is a saddle tank engine called Peter. And this, his long-suffering driver, who must wait a couple of hours every morning before there's enough steam pressure to go anywhere. While steam sat around simmering, the enemy was on the move. Was the First World War the beginning of the end for steam locomotion? I believe it was. Um, the crews certainly loved it. They, they could come home relatively clean at night unless they'd been shot. Um, they didn't have to clean the thing out too heavily in the morning. You didn't have to spend two and a half hours getting it ready to go again the next day. It must have been the beginning of the end for steam. And they didn't stop making petrol and diesel locos when the war was over. This machine is of 1950s vintage. In fact, throughout the 20th century, narrow gauge was always more adaptive than its big brother. This is an electric locomotive, a machine weird enough to be borrowed for a Bond movie a few years ago. The motor rails, rapiers, simplexes and all the other ugly ducklings moved easily from military life into city street. After all, where there was muck, there was money to be made. After the war, um, after the second war, this is, they were actually used on road construction and, and big construction sites. Um, some of ours were used on construction of reservoirs in Essex, just pulling out all the muck while they were, you know, while they were digging them out. They were used all over the place until the dumper truck killed them. The dumper truck is the death of, of the narrow gauge locomotive. Even the electric locos that we have were working in the 60s, certainly in the late 60s. And they, they were working right up to the last minute. And then the dumper trucks took over. The Great War must have seemed a long way away to places like Dunster on the North Somerset coast. There's a siding at the station here, which enabled the wealthy family at nearby Dunster Castle to entertain visiting polo teams. People were beginning to go to the seaside. In later years, it came to be known as a holiday. What a different world it was then. I mean, once kids, if they've got the money, fly to Hong Kong now and all over the world. The world's so small. But in those days, it was an, advent an adventure for family shepherd. Um, my brother, my sister and myself to go with mummy and daddy to build sand castles on the coast at uh, Birchington. I don't know why we chose Birchington, it's near Ramsgate, near Margate. That was the great summer holiday for two weeks. Uh, but daddy was a mad nut for steam engines, that's where I get it from of course. He was LMS, in maroon coaches and all that. And he said, oh we don't want to buy, build sand castles, uh, David and Peter and Judy, let's go and watch the steam trains go by. So we spent the entire fortnight's holiday hanging on the level crossing gauge watching these steam trains go by. That was my first introduction to steam railways, it was in my blood from that moment.
The steam engine, meanwhile, was continuing to grow more muscular. This was the sexiest thing on wheels in the Great War era, Churchwood's classic mogul design for the Great Western. exhaust was music to the ears when the engine, normally kept on the Severn Valley Railway, went to the West Somerset on a brief visit. So general purpose, uh, they're not an express engine, but they're middle of the range, so we say, uh, both for goods work and passenger work. They worked on branch lines, uh, as they, they did in, on the Minehead branch in the olden days. So 30 years ago, you'd have seen engines like this going up and down every day. Nigel's just about to drop off the single line staff, which has been our authority to, to travel from Blue Anchor to Minehead. There's only one of those, so that means as a single line we know there's nothing going to come and meet us halfway. Little bit of effort now just to get us into the platform. Keep an eye out here and make sure all our happy passengers aren't standing too close to the platform edge. Now a little bit of break in there. And hopefully to bring ourselves to a stop by the stop board. The 260 mixed traffic engine was a mainstay of the big four companies that ran Britain's railways until 1948. This was a Gresley variant. And this, a southern type that David Shepherd was to sketch at his local Guildford shed at the very end of steam. It was engines like these pressed into passenger service on summer Saturdays that so many people fondly remember. Images of childhood from that age of innocence. I didn't see it as romance in those days, but it is now. It's romance and nostalgia, but in those days it was part of the everyday scene, I suppose. But I was a young kid, I was just three or four years old. It was exciting. And it still stays, you see, with Thomas the Tank Engine. If, if you take your tiny grandchildren uh, to a toy shop now, if they want a steam, uh, if they want a train set for their birthday, you go to a big toy shop, and I guarantee you most of those train sets will have steam engines in them. In the 1920s, early members of the castle class had a publicity value out of all proportion to their revenue earning capacity. They were the window dressing of a business whose real trade was being carried out in the backyard. And that business was freight. Hundreds of thousands of goods wagons were endlessly shuffled around the country in a slow motion dance that went on 24 hours a day. The 
goods trains had the uncanny knack of making themselves almost invisible. You didn't know where they were going or what they were carrying. They were just there, the background noise of everyday life. Santa's little helper, for instance, spent no less than 86 years just running backwards and forwards in yards that were only a stone's throw from her home shed, adding a few bob every day to the Midland Railway balance sheet. That was in the days when almost everything went by rail, when the lifeblood of the nation was her trade with the rest of the world. Manufactured goods went out, raw materials came in, and were whisked away by train. Anything you wanted, the railways were common carriers, and uh, they would carry virtually anything, uh, provided it would fit through the fit into the loading gauge, fit through the tunnels, and fit under the bridges. Then the railway would carry it for you. There would be open wagons carrying um, coal, maybe closed wagons with animal feed stuffs protected from the weather. The railway had a range of vehicles, wagons with uh, a, a limited amount of heating in, so that they could carry perishable fruit in the winter without it uh, freezing and becoming and, and destroying and parcels traffic mail order came by train largely and the railway ran a fleet of of, of, of minivans and wagons and horses horse drawn trucks and so on depending on which part of their history you look at which connected with the services the pace of life for trains like this was decidedly slow before long they'd be stuck in a siding again, where, no doubt, the eventual green flag would interrupt a good chat. Right, a tip from the guard, better go. See you all. Yeah. The handbrake's off, Wendy. Oh, off, yeah. All right, we've got the tip from the guard, we're on the move again. Unfitted freight, so we won't do much shift in the way of speed. Toddle on steady. So the locomotive we're on at the moment uh, was very much built for the branch line use that it's seeing in preservation. Built for branch line workings with one or two coaches, or as we are today with some trucks in the days when the railways used to take freight. So we're very much, if you like, recreating the branch line atmosphere that uh, our grandparents would have seen in the 30s and 40s when the railways used to shift a great deal more freight than it does today. The Great Railway Works became the biggest factories in Britain. The young David Shepherd was a visitor to Swindon. Everywhere I looked was a fantasy world of excitement. Green engines and oh, in bits, you know, wheels and all the gubbins. But the workforce made it such a thrill for me. They were super because they pulled every string they could to make me happy, you know. I've just seen Swindon Works, for example, it was in the summer and I've been uh, painting for about five days. And I got to know all the lads, you know, in, in, the, in this particular erecting shop. And one guy bought a whole bag of fresh strawberries out of his allotment to put on my easel while I was working, you know. Now, those little memories were so lovely, because uh, they, they shared with me my love of steam. They loved steam. They weren't just workers in a factory. They, it, was a, it was a life to them, like coal miners, you know. Uh, they, they, and they were heartbroken when steam finished and they were all thrown on the scrap heap. I spent, for example, three weeks in crew locomotive works when they had 6,000 people employed in that loco works. And uh, they had to put a screen around me in the end because I was disturbing the workforce. You know, they were all watching me paint. So they had to put a screen around me. But I was painting this big painting of True Works, which um, BR subsequently bought for £60. And I think it's in the National Railway Museum collection. And they were, uh, to paint in those conditions, they, had, they were carrying Duchess Pacifics over my head on travelling cranes, you know, <laughs> while I was underneath painting. A railway career often began with the job of cleaner. 
Truant, this is the charging cleaner. He'll tell you what to do. Arthur, I want you to get a set of men on 4237 for me. Righto. Come on, boy. Harry has started on the first stage of his career. From now until his working life is finished, he will be concerned with locomotives. Locomotives of all kinds and sizes. Tank engines and tender engines, sturdy little shunters and giant expresses. Young Harry would have been impressed with this giant express in absolutely immaculate condition. But it's taken days to achieve, including attention to hundreds of servicing details, many of them underneath the engine. The locomotive weighs 89 to 90 tonnes. That weight obviously being distributed through its main driving axles and through its front two bogey axles, all of which have to be thoroughly lubricated, lubricating all the rods, the axle boxes behind here, all the outside motion, on the inside there, all the reverser arm gear moving forward, the cross head, the slide bars, connecting rod, piston rods, moving on to the top of the engine, in there there are over 20 pots of oil, all of which have got to be maintained. Just moving on to the front, front valve rod, knuckle joints, rocking arms, inside pistons down below and valve gear on the top. Front bogey axle, bogey boxes, moving round onto the front of the engine, lubricating pots there for the valve gear rods under these covers. One trip and it's all got to be done again. But there wasn't just one engine to clean. Sheds like Old Oak Common had a hundred locomotives on the books. And shed foremen struggled to keep machines clean when they were always needed back in traffic. The engine that had pulled goods trucks all week was likely to be rostered for excursion traffic at the weekend. And a long way away in the countryside at the end of the chain, the tank engine driver was suddenly a busy man with no time to stop for a chat. His branch line was becoming the bottleneck that threatened to bring the whole railway network to a standstill. Here, the signalman's operating level crossing gates, doing his best to keep the growing volume of road traffic moving without hampering the flow of trains. In this case, trains to Minehead. The signalman's dog seems to find it tiring just watching. When trains were late, the pressure was very much on the lonely signalman. The row is divided into sections controlled by signal boxes and quite often there would be a train at every signal in every section and um, the, the numbers which were carried in the, in, in the 1950s following the post the, the development of, of holidays after the war um, just brought the railway to almost crisis point on Saturdays. The station was extended by the Great Western Railway in 1936 to accommodate trains of up to 19 coaches in length. 
and this was because the railway was so busy. Mine had developed following the advent of the railway as people started to travel by, by train to their holiday destinations. If you imagine the west of England without the motorway network, without all the fine dual carriageway roads, and imagine much lower car ownership, then the trains, and to a lesser extent bus services and coach services, they were the only way to get here. So this place would have been absolutely hectic. For little boys, anticipation turned to gratitude at journey's end. You went up and thanked the engine driver. You don't do that anymore. There was romance. He got you safely to your destination with your bucket and spade, and it was lovely, and you looked up at the cab, and there was the glowing fire on his face, and it was magic. It was fantasy land for kids. I was one of them. I was those, one of those archetypal little boys with his cloth cap and his bucket and spade. On lines like this, average speeds were well below 30 miles an hour and stayed that way forever. But on the main line, it was a different story. The London and North Eastern Railway was about to unveil a flying machine. Any detail of this locomotive is instantly recognisable to any steam enthusiast. It was, of course, the fastest class of engine ever built, ensuring a place in transport history for its designer. The A4 Pacific was Sir Nigel's entry in the race to the north between the LMS up the west coast to Glasgow and the LNER via the east coast to Edinburgh. Streamlining was all the rage in the 30s and the big four all eventually experimented with air smoothing, though it only stuck completely in this one class. But was it art? Very interesting question because being an artist I've got very strong views on art and I don't like art deco and to me this will upset the Nigel Gesley people. They're great guys, of course they are. But I personally don't like steam engines that are streamlined. It's purely my personal opinion. Why shouldn't I say it? Um, I don't like a, a streamlined engine because I like to see all the workings. But Nigel Gresley, being a sort of Art Deco 1930s Odeon Cinema type thing, you know what I mean, Odeon Cinema, that's Art Deco to me. And he said, well, we've got to make it streamlined and cover all the working parts, ostensibly to presumably make it go faster. I personally don't like it. Um, in any case, they took most of the streamlining off, didn't they? Because it was more practical not to have it all over the wheels. Opinions may vary on how it looked, but not on how it went. 6007 was for a while the only member of the original class of 34 locomotives to be running in regular traffic. Here she's being prepared at Bury for a canter along the East Lancashire Railway. On this 
heritage line, she's limited to 25 miles an hour, which is, of course, just over 100 miles an hour slower than Mallard. But nevertheless, it is easy to imagine the thrill of that non-stop dash to Scotland. Meanwhile, on the LMS, Stanier was planning his revenge, the Coronation Pacifics. The rhythm of the exhaust grows stronger, faster, 112.5 miles an hour for two miles, smoothly surging over the metals. A supreme effort, and Coronation has done it, 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. Of course, the A4s had the last word on top speed. Meanwhile, at the Millennium, there was talk of rebuilding Duchess of Hamilton to the streamlined form of the 30s. Another controversial subject. I'd like to see it, because it reminds me of my generation. My dad, you see, he was LMS, streamlined Duchess Pacifics. Yeah, they were hideous in my view, but, but it's all part of the evolution of the steam railway engine, you know, so why not? I don't like it, but that's beside the point. This engine was but a twinkle in its designer's eye in the 30s, but the type of train it's pulling was a feature of pre-war Britain. Speed was one thing, but wealthy people also wanted to travel in style and have a good lunch. The Pullman Car Company Limited understood the needs of the inner man. This is how the other half lived on trains like the Queen of Scots, the Brighton Bell and the Golden Arrow. It's an age which is vanishing quickly, but the people who run the Orient Express were determined the elegance of that era would not disappear completely. So, one by one, they've restored the old Pullman cars into a stunning train. It can cost the best part of half a million pounds to refurbish each car. Every one of them is distinctively different, which can mean searching the whole country for the right materials or the right craftsmen. And each of these vehicles has a story to tell, like the car that's nowadays known as Phoenix. The car has actually been renamed Phoenix. Originally she was called Rainbow, uh, but she was damaged by fire before the war and was rebuilt with a completely new body in 1951 and renamed Phoenix after the Greek mythology legend of the bird rising from the ashes. And you will see if we move towards the end of the car that we have taken up the theme of the name. In the washroom which has the legendary bird rising from the ashes on the floor. At their peak, the railways directly or indirectly employed a million people. And back in the 30s, every little boy wanted to be an engine driver. Companies like the London, Midland and Scottish had large publicity departments to cater for the popular curiosity about what life was like on the railways. The system of training men for the footplate has been carefully devised to ensure that nothing is lacking either in practical working experience or in theoretical training. Different classes of locomotives are designed to haul particular types of trains. So, as time goes on, Jim handles an increasing variety of locomotives and trains. He becomes a regular driver. And if he was lucky, a driver like young Jim might eventually get his hands on one of the new Stania mixed traffic engines that were eventually to form the biggest single class of British steam locomotives, the legendary Black Five. If, if you had to choose one particular design of steam locomotive, of the whole lot, whatever you choose, somebody will contest it. But I believe that very, very, very rarely man 
designs a perfect machine. I've said this reference, my painting of Black Five Country, um, the Black Fives at Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, I would say the Black Five. Um, it's like an aeroplane, you know, the DC-3 Dakota. The only replacement is another one. It just happened to be perfect. It's a legendary aeroplane. Same with the Black Five. 840-something from 1930-something until the 1950s, they were building them, right? Uh, they were workhorses. They worked in the most appalling conditions towards the end of steam, but they went on working. And I believe, stick my neck out, that's a perfect design for a steam engine. Nobody's ever bettered it. Only four of the 842 engines carried names in BR service, but this one, running recently on the Met, has been subsequently named RAF Biggin Hill. A memory of the dark days of war when the Black Fives did some of their finest work. David Shepherd can remember the effect the war had on Britain's railways. They were hammered. They were absolutely hammered into oblivion. But they made, played a massive part in World War II, D-Day, God. You know, the railways were an integral part of our, rail, of our transport system. All the soldiers coming back from Dunkirk, famous scenes, never to be repeated as part of our history. Without the railways, what would we have done? Goodness knows, heaven knows. Special trains were hurriedly assembled, and in the space of eight days, 620 specials were run from seven ports in the southeast of England. We had one weapon that Captain Mannering would dearly have liked at Warmington on Sea. It was something to make the Hun think twice. The uh, Rumney House and Dimchurch, which we all know, I was born and bred on that railway in Kent, back to Kent again, you see, runs from Dimchurch to Rumney. Lovely little, beautiful engines. God knows how old they are now, two hurricane and green goddess, you know, they're famous. Uh, but during the war, it was the deterrent to Hitler. We turned up, everybody knows this, it was an armoured train. We covered hurricane in sort of metal cladding, tin plate. <laughs> I don't know why we imagined that. But anyway, Hitler obviously saw this and thought, oh my God, I'm not going to invade England with that in the way. You know, it's a joke, it was all Dad's army. But it was serious. But somebody said to me once anyway that Hitler would never have been able to invade or get as far as London anyway because he wouldn't have been able to understand the Southern Railway timetable. <laughs> <laughs> Who told me that? The British humour was being stretched to the limit by 1940. Incendiaries by the thousands set fire to property. But a train couldn't dodge a plane or a bomb. It just had to stop or keep on. And keep on they did. Deeds of heroism by railway men and women were legion. Out of the despair of war came a machine that was guaranteed to cheer you up. A machine that would still look comical, however much you polished it. And thankfully the National Railway Museum have kept the joke alive so that Grandad can take a video to amuse the kids, or Stepney can go about his business with a happy face. The fireman is just relieved that someone else has lost it on that other engine. And all these years later, small boys still look concerned when they see what Mr Bullitt built to help the war effort. Don't be fooled by that golden arrow headboard and don't think for a minute that they haven't put all the bits on yet. This is it, the finished article. The Q1 goods locomotive built for the Southern Railway. But will it still bring a smile to Mr Shepherd's face? Yes, oh goodness me, yes, well that was an austerity locomotive. I mean, the end, it is austerity. But Bully had had a job to do and he designed it to fulfil a purpose. A short-lived engine probably, just literally at the end of the war when we... You know, materials were scarce, raw materials, and it worked. Didn't matter what it looked like. But it's got a sort of special niche now in the preservation movement because it's so extraordinary. Yeah, the ugly duckling. Bullard had the last laugh. The engine turned out to be the most powerful 060 tender locomotive ever built in Britain. With a power-to-weight ratio of a sports car, if only the driver could prevent the wheels spinning around.
say, a moderately good engine to drive, but there are problems with it being light in weight. It tends to be what we would call light on its feet. It'll pick the wheels up very easily if you're not careful. If you open the regulator too quickly and too fast, you'll slip. Uh, but that apart, it's a very strong engine, and it's reasonably well set out. When the engine first came out, one of the leading designers from another railway looked at it very cynically because of its appearance, and he asked the designer of the engine, where do you put the key? Nowadays, engines are kept in a condition that was rarely seen in steam days. But what state were they in at the end of the war? Flogged to death, yeah. And the railways were flogged to death. They never recovered from World War II. And then if you want me to be really political, somehow the great spirit of the railways, the four grouping, LNER, MS Southern and GWR, the spirit went out so much when they were nationalised. The drivers, the old drivers, didn't know who they were working for. It became a faceless, megalithic organisation. Um, and then came Beijing, and I don't think the railways have ever recovered. We had the opportunity after World War II to think, God, we'll have a transport policy, an integrated transport policy, which we're talking about now, but we don't do it. An integrated transport policy, trams, roads, electric traction, steam or, or diesel, roads and railways, in other words, but we lost the opportunity. What nationalisation didn't stop was the partisan debate about which railway had built the best engines. Was it the Great Western 460, which had, after all, set the standard early in the century? Was it the Gresley designs? Many people believe the V2 mixed traffic locomotive was an absolute war winner. Does the crown rightly belong to Sir William Stanier? Or were Bullard's engines, after rebuilding, the best of the lot? There is, of course, no objective answer the designs were years apart, the needs of each railway were different as were the functions of each locomotive type. But that doesn't stop the argument about design, though David Shepherd, for one, won't be drawn. You'd have to ask somebody who's more technically knowledgeable than I am about this sort of thing, because I, I come back to the point, I just love steam engines. I don't, know any, I don't know much about the history, really I don't. I don't care. It's what Black Prince does to me when I'm on a foot rate, that's what matters. Whistle. Steam brake off, okay. Yeah. The brake off on the uh, tender brake off. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. You still want the parts open, do you? Uh, I think we can close them now. Close them. Right. It's a bit quieter with them closed. Halfway through a turbulent century, it might have seemed to railwaymen as though there'd been quite enough change already. Whereas actually the pace of change was increasing, and Britain's railways were heading for revolution. Was there still a role for that faithful old kettle on wheels?